Hi, this is Julie Lubinsky. I am the web manager for the Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation, and I'd like to welcome you all to the first uh, webcast with our nurse Linda. She um, will be answering questions that you have and just talking in general about anything paralysis and SCI related healthcare questions. So please don't be shy. I will be making sure, you know, asking you guys to this is your time to talk up. She's um, live. You'll hear her voice in a minute. Um, um, she's also in our community um, every Wednesday from 8 to 9 p.m. Eastern Time. Um, and that's not a live chat, but please leave your questions on our community and she goes in and she'll answer your questions. Um, she'll type in the questions. But this is your opportunity to talk with her live. So I am going to pass it on to Nurse Linda to get this started. And she, if you're following her on the community right now, she just wrote a four-part four part series on skin care. So we're going to start off with skin care. So if you have any questions, please go ahead and ask them at you know, appropriate time. Or if you're on the phone, go ahead and ask. If you do not have a microphone or on the telephone, please use the chat box in the bottom left-hand corner of the web portion. Thanks. And Nurse Linda, thank you so much for joining us today. Hello, and thank you. I'm so happy to be here with everybody. And I hope that you do um, take a moment to write in any questions that you have. Sometimes I know it's kind of it's kind of a little bit um, intimidating to write a question into a kind of a nebulous computer, but please feel free. If you've been following along in the Ask Linda blog, you've seen that we've just completed this uh, four-part series about skin care, and I really try to put a lot of functional ideas in the in the blogs, and I hope that you will feel free to write in. Even if you don't have a question, maybe you've been doing something that's been very important and has made it an easier adjustment or right. easier adaptation Don't in your life. Is yes, okay? is there a question? Hi, I heard somebody call in. Um, who's talking? My name's Spencer. Spencer? You're talking, yeah. Spencer, Spencer do you have a question? Yes, I'm trying to say it. My question is, we're talking about skin care, you know, and, and not where not to go. We're talking like to the little light bulbs, you know, the, those chicks that get in the thing in the jigger, you know, back in the 90s. What, what would that be called? Anybody want to call in? What's the answer to that question? Do you remember what I'm referring to? Sun tanning bed? Oh. So, so um, you're saying you're you're the dangers of using uh, sun tanning? No. I'm a Are you say Baba Booey soon? I'm a quasi believe you. Um, yeah, I wonder what you guys talking about skin care and stuff. Are you, are you referring to the light treatment that used to be given for pressure ulcers? Well, I'm not sure about the light treatment for pressure ulcers, but I'm referring to just the general use of predominantly women and women or whoever with um, the, I just referred to it, it's a tanning bag. Tanning bed. Oh. You want to refer to skin problems? Oh, yeah. We will get that. About. Spencer, I'm going to let Linda go ahead and talk about um, the start of her skincare series because when she starts talking about that, she will bring up um, that instance and also the importance of like UV and uh, suntan lotion. So, Spencer, just just stay on hold there, and I'm going to let Linda just start the disc basic discussion about skincare. So, go ahead, Linda. Yeah, so that's an interesting question because let's just start right in with general skin care. And that is the same for just about everybody. Make sure your, your skin is clean and dry at all times. And we hear about that a lot. What does that mean to keep, you know, of course we all take baths, we all take showers. 
and we dry off. So what, just what exactly does that mean? Well, a lot of times in healthcare we say keep your skin clean and dry. And when you clean your skin, you want to be able to use a soap that won't be too drying to the skin itself because the skin is a living organ. It's one of the organ systems of our body. It's the only organ system that has contact with the outside world. Our other organs like our heart and our lungs are inside our body. So we have to use to help our skin to uh, protect ourselves. So if you use a, a soap that has a lotion in it or an emollient kind of soap that will help moisten your skin, that's a good thing to do that will help keep your skin clean. You want to avoid things like antibacterial soap or soaps that have a lot of drying because that's going to make our skin real dry, itchy, and flaky. So keeping your skin clean is one thing. And then we always say, keep your skin dry. And people, well, I dry off my skin. And of course, we all do. But there are places in our bodies where it just uh, the skin comes in contact with other skin, and so things tend to get kind of moist in that regard. So in places like in um, the groin, in the gluteal fold, um, better known as the butt crack, um, because of uh, excretions through passing gas or whatever, moisture tends to collect there. So when we say keep, keep our skin clean and dry, that's what we're really talking about is protecting those areas. And talking about using a tanning bed, that brings an interesting uh, perspective because um, when you use a tanning bed, there's no cushion between you and the tanning bed itself. So you're really putting yourself, just by laying in that tanning bed, you're putting yourself at a higher risk of skin breakdown because there's no... Uh, there's there's nothing padding between you and your skin and that tanning bed. Now, sometimes people will um, recommend tanning beds for the vitamin D exchange, but you don't really get that in a tanning bed. You get much more of that by being out in the sun, and then your body will uh, exchange vitamin D and produce more vitamin D just through the sunlight, but it's a different type of ray that you get in a tanning bed. So you really don't get a lot of vitamin D exchange there. So for somebody who has impaired um, function, impaired mobility, or definitely for somebody who has impaired sensation, you probably don't want to be in a tanning bed because the risk is going to do more. It's going to be greater than the value that you're going to get from the tanning bed. Probably the better thing to do would be to sit out in the sun on a pleasant day, not too hot of a day, and not for too long, and you want to be sure and block out the rays from the sun that are that are going to be burning your skin, so using a suntan lotion. You never want to get out into the sun and get that sunburn. That's something that we all should, regardless if we have paralysis or if we don't, that's something we want to avoid because that can lead to skin cancers later down the line. So it makes our skin, it makes that top layer of skin very fragile and then it's going to want to slough off as it, as it uh, peels. So we want to avoid that kind of thing. We want to keep our skin healthy. We, of course, we want to have that glow about ourselves. Um, so we Lisa, do want I'm going to interrupt you just for a second. Um, if, if um, I'm getting, we're getting a, um, there's a lot of feedback. So if you, could, if people on the phone could use star six and mute your lines until you have a question. Um, or I will have, um, the, if, I, if we hear noise, um, the Ready Talk operator will we'll press star six so, to mute your phone lines just to make it more, um, uh, less feedback. And also, um, Linda, um, there is a hand raised. Um, yeah. And also there's a question in the chat box from Betsy who um, said it's okay to use her name and read her question out loud. Okay, um, I'll go ahead and read this question from Betsy. Uh, she has a 26-year-old son who's paralyzed at T5 uh, um, on April in 2012. And for approximately the past year, he's been sweating profusely from below his level of injury. That's an interesting uh, phenomenon. He has seen an, an endocrinologist. His thyroid's fine. He doesn't have TB, has no lymphoma. None of the MDs can ask the, answer the question why he sweats profusely. He has three pressure wounds on his behind that are being treated by a wound MD, 
plus hyperbaric and uh, ab uh, antibiotics through a PICC line. Any ideas why he sweats so much? Well, that is an interesting question. Generally, especially at the T5 le level, um, people um, sometimes if they have a, an injury that's at T6 or above, so T5 right above the T6 area, um, generally people will uh, have a thing called autonomic dysreflexia which is a situation where their body is reacting. Uh, the important thing to remember, Betsy, is that even though somebody is paralyzed that, and you don't feel from below the level of the injury, your body will still react to pain. And so sometimes people who have an injury above T6, they get the autonomic dysreflexia, which is one of the symptoms of that. It's, it's a misinterpretation of signals um, because of the spinal cord injury. So generally people will sweat above the level of injury but not below. Betsy's son has the exact opposite problem. My suspicions are is that he's having some kind of autonomic dysreflexia but not in the typical manner since he's sweating below the level of injury. And so uh, my, my guess is that probably due to his pressure wounds, um, he's probably having a reaction to that because even though he doesn't feel those pressure wounds, his body is still sensing that there's some kind of pain. Because of the spinal cord injury, that pain cannot be interpreted. And so he's probably having some kind of reaction because of those pressure wounds. When those pressure wounds get healed up, then I imagine that that profuse sweating is going to go away. So what do you need to do about it right now? You need to talk to his physician about autonomic dysreflexia. And the first thing you'll be told is, no, that only happens above the level of the spinal cord injury. But because of these wounds, I suspect he's having an unusual reaction to this where his body's reacting to the, the pain and the pressure ulcers. The body's reacting to the fact that the skin has been interrupted. And so, therefore, it doesn't know what to do, and therefore it's, it's re, it says, well, okay, then I'll sweat because it's not being able to interpret those messages correctly. So my guess is if he um, takes the medication for dysreflexia, probably that sweating will be reduced. Um, sometimes people are hesitant to medicate individuals with spinal cord injury, um, maybe during the dressing changes if the sweating is more profuse, like during the time of the dressing change or right after the dressing change. Sometimes people are hesitant because they say, well, you know, you have no sensation, so therefore you have no pain, but your body is still reacting to it. And so sometimes a little pain medication might help with that. Um, the antibiotics through the PICC line, he could be having some kind of reaction. Maybe he's allergic to that particular antibiotic, and that is um, the reason for the profuse sweating. So there could be a couple of factors in play here. Um, one of the things that I don't see in your message here, Betsy, is, um, oh, I see here he says, yes, he's had many episodes of autonomic dysreflexia. So my guess is you maybe will um, be able to reduce some of the sweating with the treatment for the dysreflexia. Another thing that I have learned um, in, in just through my career is a lot of times people think, that because they have a cushion on the bed or because they have a cushion in their chair and they have pressure sores, that, that it's okay because they can go ahead and sit on those pressure sores because they have a cushion and that takes care of things. But a cushion actually doesn't. Every time you sit on that pressure sore, you're causing more pressure. So you're kind of starting over every time you sit on it. So I don't know if he's um, still seated. It is a great... Um, hampering to your quality of life and to be able to get out and do things, but to stay off those pressure areas also might reduce some of the episodes of sweating and will certainly help to heal those. So happy birthday to him who will be 26 on the 26th. That's yeah, his yeah. golden birthday and that's a special day. So I hope you plan to do something really wonderful for that. But um, some of those ideas should help you deal with some of that um, hyper sweating episodes. Linda, I, I want to um, let you know that Bernadette has her hand raised. So Bernadette, if you want to ask your question. 
Star six will unmute if you're muted. Thank you. Um, I'm trying to understand how calluses are related to pressure sores. I read your article, but um, I just can't quite visualize it. Could you explain it to mm -hmm. me, please? Mm -hmm. Well, a callus comes because there's some irritation to the skin, and the skin will protect itself by building up a callus. So if something is rubbing you, um, it will develop its extra skin in that spot where this irritation is occurring. And we all know what a callus looks like. It's that real thickened part of skin, and so it gets... It gets uh, really dense. It's a rough kind of uh, skin, and it has no elasticity to it. So calluses don't stretch like the rest of our skin is made to bend and stretch with our bodies as we bend and stretch and move. But calluses don't. They don't have elasticity to them. So it's like a hard patch of skin that won't move. So what will happen with a callus becomes dry, and eventually it will crack open. And if, uh, eventually what will, you will have is a, a pressure ulcer through that callus which, provide, which will then allow access of bacteria to get through the skin which is our natural uh, defense against bacteria to keep it out of our bodies. So we want to keep calluses off of our bodies. We want to prevent them before it happens and um, we want to keep them moist. We want to keep that skin soft and supple so it can move with us and so that it doesn't dry out and crack open, letting those, letting those bacteria get in. So most people will find calluses on their heels from poorly fitting shoes. But as individuals with decreased sensation or with paralysis, we can get a callus anywhere. We can get it from under a splint on our shin. So we can get calluses in weird kind of ways. Now, interestingly enough, I developed a callus right on the pad of my thumb because I had some kind of rash there, and so I was scratching it a lot. And by golly, I got a, a callus right on the thumb pad of my thumb and I thought oh, I should really take a picture of that because exactly what happened was a very thin callus. It was really just kind of like a rough spot of skin and by golly sure enough it cracked right open and a little bacteria got in there. Well for me it was quick and easy. I could just put a little um, antibiotic ointment and it moistened the area and then it it healed right up. So it turned out that it really wasn't much of a problem for me. But sometimes those little calluses, until, unless we get right on top of them, they can really kind of take over. And what happens is, is that skin just doesn't stretch. They dry out and they crack. And then you have a little stage one pressure ulcer. There, um, in the blog, there's um, some definitions of the different stages. And so stage one pressure ulcer is an ulcer that just is an opening in the very top layer of our skin. And then stage two goes into the into further into uh, layers. Stage three goes even deeper, and a stage four goes already goes all the way down into the bone. And so we don't want those because we don't want infection getting in there. Anytime we have an opening of our skin, we're very open to um, getting those pressure ulcers. If there's some kind of uh, exudate in there that we can't see into the bottom of this pressure ulcer, so we don't know how deep it is, we call that unstageable. Um, sometimes people think, well, if I have a stage one, it can move into a stage two, or as I heal a stage four, it will go up into a stage three. It's not really a, a sliding kind of scale uh, type of operation. It's, you know, the stages are just a descriptive term. Um, so, yes, there's a follow-up question. Is that what you're yeah, going to say? I have, a, I have a question. Um, my elbows are bad. How do I protect them better on the quad and use my elbow to shift weight? Is there another way to shift? Yes. Um, there are a, a lot of ways to shift your weight. If you're a, a quadriplegic, you might have a wheelchair with a tilt function on it, so you can tilt frequently. Um, the rule of thumb is 15 seconds every 15 minutes. 
um, to relieve your pressure. You want to relieve pressure on your skin every 15 minutes. So if you're using your elbow to relieve pressure to shift weight, so you're applying pressure onto that elbow, that's going to cause that friction that could develop a callus and eventually in, uh, into a pressure ulcer. There are other things that you can do. You can uh, put your uh, arm over to the side of the wheelchair and drape your body across the um, arm of the wheelchair so that you're relieving pressure on one buttock side at a time and then hold it for 15 seconds and then drape on the other side. I've uh, seen people do a lot of uh, little tricks, memory tricks. Some people will buy a watch that has an alarm on it that will beep or vibrate so that every 15 minutes they're doing their uh, skin pressure reliefs. Uh, some people will watch TV at every commercial. They'll do a, a skin pressure relief. Um, different people will do uh, things. You know, it's like watching uh, TV and people play those party games where every time the the character on TV says a certain word, you know, then they'll then they'll do some activity. You can do that kind of thing at work. Um, even if even if you're not doing pressure relief, sometimes at work, you know, we all kind of get clowning around, and we'll, every time this person says a particular word, we'll you know do a pressure relief. So maybe um, going into a meeting or you know at different periods, every time if you're in a a long meeting, every time the agenda item changes, to do a pressure relief. So it just kind of becomes second nature because we are also um, because we are, uh, it's so difficult to get the idea of pressure release done, and it's so frequent. And when we first are injured, it's so very difficult um, to lift our bodies around and to do these kinds of things that sometimes people think, oh, this is just so much work. But it becomes ingrained as part of your life. Uh, another thing, and you want to be very, very careful with this, is you can lean forward in your wheelchair. You just don't want to topple out of your wheelchair, but lean forward, and then that releases a little bit of pressure on your um, on the bones where you're sitting. So that can also be um, a help. So doing that every 15 minutes. You still need a cushion. You need a, a pressure dispersing uh, cushion, something that will make the pressure not just focused on those bony prominences. The bones are resting on muscle, and muscle is good for dispersing pressure. Fat is not. Fat is like sitting on a pillow or on a piece of, of foam. It's cushy, but what happens is it just collapses, so it makes a hard surface underneath you while you're sitting on those. You really need a cushion that's made for sitting uh, for people who have decreased sensation that will disperse the pressure around in the cushion so it's not just in that one particular spot. But even if you have a cushion, you still have to do the pressure releases. And I think that that's something that we don't really convey really well as you keep have to doing those uh, Linda, pressure releases. Yes? We have a question in from Oscar in the chat yes. box. Okay. Uh, if you want to scroll up, do you want oh, me to read yes. it? Oh, yes. Oscar says, um, I think I've lost the first part of his question. Oh, wait, I can scroll up. If you scroll up, but I can read it for you. So okay. Oscar says he has an SEI in T8 section. He had an accident about eight months ago, and since then his, his feet hurt a lot. He, he doesn't know why. He would like to know um, what that might be. Um, and well, he follows up that he lost sensation from his belly button to his toes but can still feel pain on his feet. And so, you know, Oscar, really that's quite a great thing for you because you'll be able to, when you start feeling something's out of place in your feet or if you start feeling too much pressure, you will be able to feel that so that you'll know you can either move your foot or you can take your hands and pick up your feet and readjust them so that you'll have... You, you won't have problems um, with pressure ulcers because you'll recognize when that pressure is getting to be too much. So why do you feel that? Well, you know, this is one of the natures of spinal cord injury in that the spinal cord is made up of a gigantic amount of fibers. I kind of think of it like a gigantic ponytail. 
So if you think about a woman's hair or a man's hair that they've got it in a ponytail, that's kind of what the spinal cord looks like, all these different fibers, but nerve fibers, not hair. It's about the size of your thumb, and it's kind of the consistency of jello jigglers, if you think about that. So when you have a spinal cord injury, um, the classification systems are complete injury or incomplete injury. So people think when they have a complete, when they have no sensation and they have a complete injury, that their spinal cord is completely transected. But this is hardly ever the case. Hardly ever does somebody have a, even with an, a knife wound, does it act? Does the the spinal cord ever really get cut completely. So you have some nerve fibers that are still conducting information down into your toes up, and that's why you're feeling there. So you have fibers that are intact, and hopefully you'll be able to parlay that into more recovery for you. As swelling goes down, you're eight months out, you still have the opportunity for a lot. Everyone has the opportunity for recovery because the spinal cord, like every other part of your body, will try to recover itself. Now, um, the Christopher and Dana Reed Paralysis Foundation is sponsoring a study uh, at the University of Kentucky um, where they're putting some devices in the spine to facilitate that kind of um, recovery uh, to see if they can make connections in those uh, spinal fibers that are not working. So that's one for you to really follow along because I think you're going to see some additional recovery as you go. So actually you should feel very fortunate about that. And I see somebody else has their hand up. Yeah, Leroy has his hand up and there's also a question in the chat box. So Leroy, are you on the phone that, or audio that you're able to um, ask your question out loud? Star six to unmute. Leroy, if you can, if you can, if you're not available on the audio, would you please type your question in in the chat box, and we'll get to you. So, Linda, if you, there's a question from Jennifer. Uh mm huh. -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so the question is about uh, matrix stem micro uh, matrix. Um, it's uh, it's a, a solution that can be put. Um, in open areas of the skin or body that can help with healing. Um, so is it, can it be related to healing in SCI? Probably. Um, I think that uh, it has been used in individuals with spinal cord injury. I have not seen it used myself in any of the population that I have treated, so I don't have uh, direct information about it. I haven't seen it be, be used. But... Um, it, it could be a possibility. Would you want to try that? I think you would need to get more information and talk to your health care provider about um, your particular wounds and um, how that might help you. I think that would probably the be, be the best thing. If you have a superficial wound, I don't think that you would probably want to go to that extreme of a kind of thing to use it. But um, if you have a more complicated wound, it might be just the ticket that you might be looking for. So getting more information would probably be the best um, idea for you. I'm going to just jump in, and, and, and for those that aren't on the web portion that have called in, does any of the callers, this is your chance, do you, do you have any questions? Any of the callers? Any of the callers want to, want to ask Linda anything? I have a question. Um, what is your uh, intake? My father, he's got um, a C1, C2 um, complete injury, and, with, uh, and so he's been vented for the past seven years. Um, on the pacemakers for the diaphragm. Do you have it? Oh, yes. Um, the pacemakers for the diaphragm uh, have had a particularly uh, successful course in theory. The, um, the diaphragm, the pacemakers generally work pretty well. They're very generally pretty successful. Now here's the complication. In individuals with such high level of spinal cord injury, they're usually medically very fragile individuals. They um, tend to, uh, it's a dangerous 
I don't want to use the word dangerous, but it's a very serious operation and a very serious consideration because generally what happens is if the patient qualifies for a diaphragmatic pacemaker and there's a special EMG testing that has to be done prior to implantation of those pacemakers, but if they qualify because they test the diaphragm, they see that it's capable of working, then that's the parameter for um, getting one of the uh, diaphragmatic pacemakers. They generally work pretty well. However, the complications from the surgery and the anesthesia and all of the things that go with it, the chance for infection, are extremely high. So you want to go to a place that does these often and, and that are familiar with individuals with spinal cord injury that they've done them before, that they know what they're doing, that will kind of help your odds of having a successful uh, implantation of those um, pacemakers. They certainly change the quality of life for individuals. Not always do all individuals get completely free of the ventilator. Sometimes they need to have the ventilator at night to give their bodies a rest. You know, there's all kinds of progressions that happen with this. Um, so if it's something that you want to take seriously as far as, um, you know, the mechanics of it, that, you know, they don't implant them without knowing that there's a high chance of success, but the complications can be very serious. So that's, that's really where you want to focus your uh, energies is looking at um, the person who would be doing the surgery, what kind of uh, health care they will need after they're at home, that sort of thing, because it's, um, it's a mechanical implantation. So, I, I, you know, it's certainly without, not without complications, but it's really that long-term and ongoing care that tends to be the issue. So those are the kinds of things when you talk with somebody about that, those are the kinds of things where you really want to focus your attention on what kind of long-term care would be, what are the complication risks for your particular individual. Linda, there's a Leroy typed his question in. Yes. And, and uh, we just, I'm sorry, just a reminder for the phone callers, um, if you could use star six to mute your line, star six unmutes it when you're ready to ask a question. So after, she, after Nurse Linda gets to answer Leroy's questions, I'll, I'll um, ask again if any of the phone callers have a question. So go ahead, Linda, with Leroy's uh -huh. question. Yes, so um, Leroy, so the um, walking programs after a stroke are really quite, quite the thing right now. And the reason why they're so very popular and why they're getting so much attention is because they're very successful. People are having a lot of success with this. Now, just because you go to one does not mean that you'll be one of these people that are successful. But by, by and large, the evidence shows that people who engage in these after stroke have a higher success rate of return of function than people who do not. So we know that these, you know, through research, we know that these walking programs are very effective. Generally what they are is that you are um, put into like a sling. If you think about a parachuter, it looks like a parachute harness. So you're placed in a device like this and you're suspended um, from the ceiling. What will happen is they'll start you out um, either on a treadmill or in a gym where the therapist will help you move your leg that is affected and you'll move the leg that you can move and uh, they'll start you into the cycled pattern of walking. And uh, what they do with this parachute harness, it holds you upright but it can also take the weight off your body because you're being suspended through your torso. So they'll start you out with your um, legs maybe moving five pounds of body weight because the rest is being suspended in the parachute harness. And then they'll go through, and as you progress, they'll keep adding more and more weight. Then they'll start helping you trans, uh, translate that into... Um, use of a walker and then maybe crutches and then a cane. So they keep progressing and progressing as far as you can go. Um, it's a wonderful program to try. I will hope you will have much success with it. As I say, not everyone does. It all depends on 
um, the stroke and the density of the stroke or the quality of the stroke and all that sort of thing. But um, some of these programs also do this type of walking exercise in a pool where you're suspended in a harness. And in the pool, a lot of, you know, if you think about swimming, we're buoyant in the water because that helps us with reducing the gravity. And so if we move slowly in a pool, it helps us become very buoyant, whereas if we're real forceful in a pool, it's more difficult to walk against the uh, water. So some include some water exercises, but they're, they're very good for exercising. They're very good for building up your muscles. They're very good for starting back on the road for recovery. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wish you well on that. Um, I see where you are located, and you should be able to call um, your local rehab center. Um, not every single hospital is going to have one of these walking programs, but even your local community hospital might have one of these devices. So you're going to have to call around in your area and find a place that's close to you that has a walking program for uh, stroke patients. Uh, sometimes the, the official name for it is partial weight supported walking. Again, you're partially supporting the weight. So if you ask for walking programs for uh, recovery from stroke, they, you know, if you call your local hospital, maybe if they don't have a program, they might be able to refer you to a place because people who are in uh, rehabilitation, they generally know what's going on in their community. So they probably will be able to refer you to a spot close by. I can't imagine where you're living that there's not a facility somewhere within driving range that you would be able to have someone take you to the, one of those particular programs. So um, I wish you well on that because, oh, oh, the other question, are these covered by insurance? That is a very good question. Um, usually the programs are, if they're billed as partial weight supported walking, oftentimes they are not covered by insurance. If your therapist bills that training as ambulation training, they often are covered by insurance. So before you get involved with that, talk to the therapist and you know ha give them your insurance information so they can verify your benefits before you get into it and you know generate a huge bill for yourself because your insurance doesn't decide you know decides not to pay for it. So be sure they're calling it ambulation training when you uh, deal with your insurance company that will make a huge difference with payment. Insurance doesn't really care what the ambulation training is, they just want it to be called that. Partial weight supported walking is not experimental treatment any longer. It is a, a valid ethical treatment, but some insurance companies will say, well, gee, you know, it's still experimental. Well, no, it's not, but if you call it ambulation therapy, it probably will be covered. But you always want to check your personal benefits from your payer before you get involved in any kind of therapy so you know what your financial obligations will be. So good luck on that, Leroy. I'm sure you're going to have a lot of success with that. I'll be interested in hearing how that goes for you. Any other questions while we're in the middle of our chat here? Uh, I, like, the, I have a question yeah, for you. Yes. Um, I currently do a dig stem bowel program which, uh, with a magic bullet mm -hmm. every other day in the morning, anywhere mm -hmm. from 9 to 11. I will be going um, out of state for therapy for two weeks. And it's not practical to continue to do the bowel programs in the morning. I'm going to have to do them at night. Do I, and I won't be able to wean myself into it before I go, is there any risk of me either not being able to go since I'm switching um, so abruptly, or will I be at risk of, you know, pooping in my chair? Well, yes and yes. Um, so are there risks for switching abruptly? Not really. If you do it in the evening after dinner, um, technically, uh, physiologically, you should be okay. You want to do it after a meal um, uh, to take advantage of the reflex of the food hitting your stomach and then the bowel starts to work. However, will you be at risk? Maybe, quite possibly. 
I would suggest that maybe you wear some kind of containment device just to be on the safe side and to be comfortable about it. Um, okay. Hopefully, if you are evacuating your bowel in the evening, it should be a natural switch. Our body does not always agree with us. So it's going to be a mat matter of trial and error for you. Um, if you are completely emptying your bowel in the evening, the next day it should be fine. If you are really worried about it and you don't have time to work into a program to switch your times, you might want to switch and try to do the bowel program every evening, every single evening instead of every other, just to ensure that you have an empty bowel the next day. Okay. That can help you transition. And then once you are in that evening program, you might want to stay in that evening program after you finish your your uh, training program, your therapy that you're going to, depending on how it, it gels with your life factors. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Good luck on that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Reminder to the phone callers, star six will mute and star six will unmute as well. If any phone callers have any questions. And I no. just wanted, I, oh, go ahead. Oh, I didn't have a question. Thank you. Okay. Well, I just wanted to mention that in the coming weeks, I'm, I'm uh, going to be, my blog is going to be focusing on insurance, how it works. And you know some of these little tips for getting insurance to maybe pay for things. Insurance is an interesting business because each policy is different. So even if you have a Blue Cross Blue Shield policy, and if I had a Blue Cross Blue Shield policy, we might not have the same benefits. So understanding how insurance works and, and how to um, ask for things is always an important uh, tip to helping you. So you can be looking forward to that. I see Bernadette has her hand raised again. Hello, Bernadette. She's typing her question. Hear me? I think. No. Oh, now I hear you. Yeah. You hear me? Okay. I have a question regarding, um, again, back to its pressure source, but in a roundabout way. Um, my insurance will not cover um, a, a more advanced seating cushion until I get a, at least two pressure source. Is there a way that I can um, appeal that or work with it since the, the cushion I have is not comfortable and um, it, I'm an incomplete quad and it's causing some issues? Mm -hmm. And I really appreciate that question because I find these one of the, to be one of the more frustrating uh, parts of the healthcare industry in that um, a, a cushion has been issued, this is what you get until you have two complications. You know, what kind of thinking is that? Um, the same thing goes for catheters, for uh, intermittent catheterizations. A certain type of catheter is issued until you have evidence of three diagnosed UTIs, which you have to have laboratory results before you can move to a different kind of catheter. I find that very frustrating, as I'm sure everyone does. Um, so one of the things that you can do is to talk to uh, your healthcare provider, um, your therapist, your nurse, find out what kind of cushion you think would be more appropriate for your type of injury, and then have your healthcare provider write a letter of medical necessity. Now that is a letter that somebody writes and they explain what your individual circumstances are and why it would be to your benefit and why it would be to the health insurance company's benefit to provide you with this. And if they can show that uh, uh, certain type of cushion is known to reduce complications of pressure ulcers um, by a certain percentage, which usually when you find the cushion that you think this is the appropriate one, you can go to their website and information about that cushion will be provided to the healthcare provider as well as to you. So they can look up that information that this kind of cushion reduces uh, pressure ulcers by such and so percent. They can put this all in a letter to the health care, um, to the health insurance company. It goes to a reviewer. Automatically it will be rejected because in, they have a, a list of things that they pay for and it does not meet 
it will not meet that specification. What you have is what meets their specification. So then you have your healthcare provider or you will have to ask for an appeal. And that's when it will go get kicked up to a higher level and there will be a person with healthcare experience that will review that information. Sometimes uh, health insurance companies will authorize uh, different things. It's really up to the payer if they decide that they're going to authorize that, that or not. It's kind of a complicated process. You need to really have the enlist the help of your healthcare provider because they need to write the letter in healthcare terms to the company um, to be able to ask for this. Um, sometimes it can be appealed again if you don't get the the answer that you're seeking. Eventually it will go to the uh, medical director of the healthcare company. If the healthcare, if your healthcare insurance has authorized such equipment for somebody else, which of course you have no way of knowing, they will then authorize it for you also. Once there's a precedent, they will continue to authorize. Uh, but they don't advertise that you can get something different outside of your policy. Um, there's also, if you're having problems with your cushions, you can look to, um, there are certain foundations that are available. You can Google um, healthcare, uh, health uh, providers for spinal cord injury foundations. And there are some personal uh, foundations, um, much like the Lions Club does glasses. Sometimes if you have a community leader, you might find a local foundation that might help you purchase a piece of equipment. Um, but that would be the way to go through your health care provider is to see about if they will write a letter of me medical necessity to express the need for a different cushion because of your specialized needs for whatever they might be. So it, it, um, one of the interesting things about that process is your healthcare provider will write the letter. They will not receive the response. You will receive the response from the health insurance company because you are the holder of the policy. So your healthcare provider writes the letter, but you have to watch your mailbox because the response will come in your mailbox which then you want to send to your health provider if you need to appeal if it does not go through. So you need to be working very closely with your health care provider to get that kind of process going. Um, in uh, health insurance companies, even in Medicare and Medicaid, there's a person at the health care company called the case manager. That person needs to be your new best friend. You need to call your health insurance company and ask for your case manager or ask that a case manager be assigned to your case. They have a little more leeway in helping people with catastrophic injury. Uh, spinal cord injury, stroke are both classified as catastrophic injuries. So they will have a little more leeway in helping you to provide the kind of services and equipment that you will need for your uh, particular case. However, when you buy a policy, you're, pay you're pay paying for that policy. They are only obligated to provide what is in that policy. That's why you have to you know, know all your resources and be sure and, and work down all of that sort of thing. So um, I see Oscar is following up on his question about his, um, he sometimes feels uh, burning on the side of his torso and um, where he does have some uh, sensation. So uh, probably what's happening there is, again, it's that kind of thing where, where um, these nerves are hyperactive. Uh, sometimes when nerves are hyperactive, it means that they're trying to grow and to um, regenerate themselves. Sometimes that burning means that the nerve is kind of growing out of its normal pathway and maybe affecting something else. So um, it's, this is one of those things that you're going to have to follow to see. There's medication that can help you with the pain. Um, you'll want to think and talk with your health care provider about that because if it's uh, regeneration, 
some of these medications that help with the pain help because they stop and slow the regeneration, and you don't want that to happen. So, um, Oscar, that that burning could be a very good thing. You'll be sure and want to talk to your health care provider about that. But again, in spinal cord injury, you know, it's it's not an all or nothing kind of thing. You probably have some nerves that are still alive. So when you're feeling that pain, you have these nerves that are still uh, wired and connected. So when you're feeling that kind of pain, it, it could be a regeneration and that could be a really a very good thing. Um, if it's happening mostly after you're taking a shower, um, then you maybe want to try to adjust the temperature of the water maybe to match your skin temperature. So that might help reduce that triggering of that too cold or too hot. It's going to set that nerve off. So make sure your water is just exactly skin temperature so it just feels like nothing uh, going over your skin. And hopefully that will help. Any other questions? We have, it is uh, 3.53, so we have about 10 minutes left. So this is your chance to ask questions. If anybody's on the phone, star six to unmute. Um, if not, um, does anybody have any questions on the phone? Bernadette had her hand raised, and also Oscar had more questions in the chat box, Linda. So it's up to you. OK. Um, let's see, Oscar, I, I just see the same, the same, I don't think Oscar has a new question. Okay. So Bernadette, go ahead and, and give me your question. Well, I'm trying to figure out how to piece this all together. Um, you've provided a lot of information. Um, what's the best thing that I can take away from today or the best couple of pieces on managing skin care? Oh, well, that's a great question because that is, that's the pulling it all together. And I think at this point, I think probably the best thing to think about in managing your uh, skin is to do those pressure releases, to be sure and turn at night. Um, even though you have cushions that are pressure reducing, to be sure and do those pressure releases, to figure out some way to just work that into your average everyday day so it just becomes a second nature to you. Um, I think that is going to be the, the key thing is to do, your, to do your pressure releases and to be sure and look at your skin. If you can't look around and see your backside, get a mirror so that you can see it and really check your skin every day because when you see a little change or a little something that's different, you'll be able to notice it right away if it's your own skin. If somebody else is looking um, and they're a consistent uh, person who's with you but then they're not maybe they're off the next day or they've gone on a vacation and you have something that's different on your skin, they might not be able to recognize it. Another person might not recognize it, but you will always know what your skin looks like. So taking that responsibility, and there again, I think because you have to be so vigilant in the beginning that people think, oh, this is going to take up so much of my time, and it, it's been fine, and it's been fine for years, so I'm just going to go ahead and skip it. Don't skip it. Keep doing it. It doesn't take any longer than putting on your makeup or, or having a shave in the morning. Check your skin. Do the same in the evening. Check whenever you can have a peek at your skin during the day. And just check all the time because you're always going to be with your skin so you'll always know what it looks like. And you'll be the first person to know there's a problem starting. So if you can correct that problem before it turns into a real situation, then you'll be doing good to help yourself and to keep yourself active and in that quality of life that you're looking for. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. I, thank you, everybody. Does any one last time we have about four minutes? If ever, if anybody else has a question, and if you could press star six on your phone to meet your line as I'm hearing some echo. Thank you very much. Um, 
we this filled up the hour, and that's so awesome. So um, I think we're going to make this a habit, a once a month month uh, web and web chat web chat with Nurse Linda if Nurse Linda is up for it, because I know the other topic we wanted to get to was our level the level of of our injury of SCI injury. Is that the correct way of saying it, Linda? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yes. So well, we'll what we're going to do is we'll save that for the next uh, web chat. Which we'll, we're going to try to keep it consistent, and if, if it works for Linda the last Wednesday of every month from 3 to 4. So we're going to start off the web chat with that unless um, another topic comes up. Please feel free to go to christopheree.org slash nurse and leave a question for her any time. She comes in on Wednesdays in the community and she will answer your question, but you're more than welcome to leave questions and comments any time and she will and see them. Just make sure you post them in the Ask a Nurse section. So Linda, I'm going to let you go ahead and talk a little bit more to, to wrap things up. Okay, so if anybody wants to write in and on the blog at any time, if you found something that makes it easier for your life in regard to skin care, bowel bladder care, um, anything that you have found that's made it easier for your life, please let us know because that's going to be important. We can share with everybody, and you know, when when you're living it, you know what works out well for you, and it may seem second nature to you, but it might be something that nobody else has really thought of. So please let us know if you have any tips that would be helpful to everybody in the community. That'd be great. And with that, I guess I will sign off. I'll look forward to hearing from you. And um, I'll see, hear, see you next month. Yeah, and I see you on the blog. I want to thank everybody for coming. This is recorded. This will be archived on our website. So please, I will put the link in the Ask a Nurse discussion area, the ChristopherReeve.org slash nurse. I will put the link to the recorded session. It will be up by uh, the end of the week. So you may check back for that. So these are being recorded and you can listen to them later. And please, while you're in the community, ask your questions and then we will talk to you next month. Thank you so much for joining us today and hope you have um, the rest of, you know, the rest of the day is good. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.